everyone hits a bump in the road. What do you do with it? Be inspired as we explore the ways people experience, navigate, and manage the ups and downs and twists and turns in this road trip called life. Welcome to another episode of Bump in the Road. The basic podcast is always free. We also have a premium subscription called Bump 2 that lets you listen in on extended behind-the-scenes conversations with our guests. Check it out at www.bumpintheroad.us. Kimberley is a highly respected actress, model, producer, TV host, and author. Her mission in life is to bring light into everybody's life. That mission stems from a highly dysfunctional childhood with an abusive alcoholic mother. But Kimber was determined to change the family paradigm, and she's here to share some of the hard-earned wisdom she's found along the way. Kimber, welcome to Bump in the Road. If you would, tell our audience a little bit about your backstory. Okay, so the backstory that you're referring to is from the book that I wrote called Greta Garbage, and um, I had never had an intention to ever write a book. That was an accidental event that happened, but a beautiful one because I wanted it to help and touch many lives. But the backstory is simply that I was a young child growing up in Pennsylvania and um, living in a very dysfunctional home. It was horrible. My father was not dysfunctional at all, but my mother was extremely, she was a raging alcoholic and my father had no idea nor my grandparents, nor my neighbors, what was really going on inside of the house. So it was a very hidden, dark place to reside in. And um, I had endured beatings daily. Uh, Everything that I did was, I would do it, and then my mother would destroy it and make me redo it again. So I guess that's where my sense of, is this good enough? (laughs) comes into play in my life. Um, But the story is is also full of hope and encouragement and uh, light and forgiveness. So I don't want to give too much of the story away, but for anybody that can relate to a dysfunctional upbringing, understand that in the end, how we grow up as adults is purely our ownership and we can we have to stop blaming because you to blame another human being for anything that happens in your lifetime or in society it's just wrong and it's dysfunctional well and i think as much as as much as anything if you don't take charge of your situation no matter how terrible it is you can't move forward you're you're just stuck Exactly. And that's what dysfunction wants. It wants you to be stuck. It doesn't want you to heal. If you heal and you're unstuck, then the fear is gone and then you're in love and light and nobody wants that because that doesn't tell good, sto- you know, exciting stories that leave you on the cliff of the, at the edge of the cliff hanging on. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I want to hang on to the edge of the cliff, though. <laughs> no, no, you don't. I think a lot of dysfunction in families, and to one degree or another, we all have had dysfunction in our families, but they're multi generational, aren't they? They are. And it's a good thing you said that because I did decide, I made a very conscious effort to break the cycle of uh, the dysfunction because it happened to my mother and to. Um, her mother's mother. And yes, it is generational, but also the choice to just say, no, I can do better and be better is what you have to do. So again, you can't blame, you can't stay stuck. You have to just say, look, I can do better than this and do it. You know, but the dysfunction isn't just in families either. It's in our institutions around us. You talk a little bit about the dysfunction of the church in your childhood. Well, sure. That's, whew, that just gave me goosebumps all over my entire body because in the home and in the church, it's all about silencing. And also in today's society, we're taught to just, you can only say what you are, what they want you to say. That is a form of abuse to an extreme. I know the damage that was caused 
by being silenced in the home. And then when you go to the church, the place where you're learning about God, your Savior, and uh, redemption and forgiveness, but yet it is a message that is tainted. And because I had an experience with the light, my teachings in the Catholic school, I would raise my hand because it was all about fear, 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 fear. And I'm like, no, God is a loving essence, a beautiful, pure, knowledgeable sanctuary of help and hope. And the nun called my mother and said, please have your daughter stop raising her hand because she's disrupting the class. Because again, it's another form of silencing the truth. And the truth is, is that the light and love is a savings. It's something, it's, it, I said this in another podcast, it's like having a black credit card with an unlimited amount of spending on it. You can do whatever you want knowing that at every step of the way, God is there holding his arms open, welcoming you with open arms. Your experience, <clears throat> excuse me, about being in the light was incredibly moving. Would you share that with the audience? Sure. It, it's a double dual edge sword, sword because in the very moment of being beaten horrifically because my mother was raging that night, grabbing the vodka bottle out from under her mattress and downing it, and with the other hand just pulling my hair and dragging me out of the bed and beating every part of my body and dragging me down the flight of stairs and asking me to clean the house. Now it's probably 1, 2 o'clock in the morning. I have school the next day. This is a repeated nightly event. It's I was just at my wit's end. It, I, I can't really say if I was five or seven, but I was in between that age. And I just curled up in a fetal position and I asked my Heavenly Father to please either take me right now, have her give me a blow that is deadly, or take her out. But one of us has to go because I cannot endure another ounce of this pain and this beating. And all of a sudden, I found myself standing in the streets of Pittsburgh. It was the middle of winter, and it was just glorifying. It was a magnificent essence of loving energy that never spoke a word, but showed me what love really was and what my life would be like. It spoke to me without saying a word. It really just embraced every cell in my body. And I was one with this essence. And I was shown that I was going to have a horrific time in my life, but to always, always, always remember this beautiful, glorifying light, to always call upon it, it would always be there. And to also share this information because it's necessary and Especially, you know, I never really even thought about it until this moment. It's so funny, Pat, because when you, I was going to Catholic school, getting a different teaching than what I was getting inside of this essence of this light. And now I know why it's so important for me to share this message is because you're not going to get it. Where are you going to get it? If it's tainted and is in, in a religious sector. So, wow, very profound moment for me. Whew. <laughs> Whoa. I, I think having that sense of spiritual guidance, that inner strength, that light, if you will, did, did, it help, did it help carry you through many other events in your life? Did you always hold on to that? I didn't at first, as, an, as a young adult, say uh, from the time that I was in that light until my mid 20s i didn't call upon it i just actually just didn't even think about it because it was one horrific horrific situation after another and i was led down a very very dark path that it is a complete miracle right now that i am not dead or i am not in jail um it, it's just miraculous so once i had my daughter i the 
memory of that moment became, it, it, it started to come to the surface for me on a conscious level. I never shared that information with anybody because I really thought everybody would think I was just out there. So I kept it inside and kept it inside and I used it in my own life. Never shared it. And then when I wrote the book, Greta Garbage, I realized it was time I had to share it. What am I going to do with this information if I don't share it? Why does it, how is it going to serve me and not the world? I've talked to several people who had near death experiences, uh, you know, very profound spiritual experiences. And almost all of them have said um, some similar things. And almost all of them have said also that it takes maybe 10 years or even more to integrate that type of experience into your life. Um, for example, um, David McGinley, I think he spent a decade or more trying to integrate this intense NDE that he had into his daily beliefs and to really grok the whole thing, if you will. Um, it seems like that's not uncommon. That's very interesting because I would like to say that I didn't have what is called a near-death experience. I yeah. would like to think that I had an alive experience because as a child, ev everything's innocent and glorious and magnified beyond what is reality. I'm so glad it wasn't a near-death experience. I'm so glad that it was an experience of aliveness and wonder and profound educating. Um, I feel so blessed, and I wish everybody could could feel that. I guess you could if you called upon that essence, please, with the purest of intention to help heal you, help heal the earth, just help heal uh, all this yuck. <laughs> <laughs> you went at an early age, you knew that you were going to go into some sort of entertainment, didn't you? Yes, because when I was standing in the essence of the light, not only did it show me all of the challenges, but it also wanted me to know that I would overcome and I would become a flight attendant and actress. Um, and, and that I was, I just knew that I was not going to be stuck in life. And, but it never showed me anything after that. Like I never knew that I would write this book. Um, quite frankly, Pat, from this moment on, I really don't know my future. The only thing that I do know is that I have done so much in my life and I have so much wisdom and so much knowledge of what to do and what not to do that really I just want to share that. And what would be on your list of things to do or not to do? It's so I was laying in bed last night thinking about a three-year plan <laughs> because I just recently had a birthday and I was asking myself, what does your life look like? Because I've already done some amazing things, though my bank account doesn't reflect anything <laughs> in, the, in the essence of that. But I have done so many amazing things to make a difference, to help. And I truly don't know where, but I would like to have a platform that teaches people about your body about healing yourself physically, emotionally, and spiritually, and how to get in and out of this cycle of dysfunction that we're in right now. Because with our mass consciousness, we're all thinking the same thing. So we're all feeding this big, ugly monster. And if we just turned our back on it and said, you know what, thank you so much. You served me. You taught me. I, I know so much now. Thank you. I'm done with you. I wish you well and on your way. And we all go the other way. It will instantaneously go away. I don't know how you do that. It just seems like the people with the smallest platforms have the biggest messages. 
Well, you know, it's interesting too. Um, there, I think there have been some studies done in meditation and I can't quote the exact numbers, but you need a relatively small number of people to raise the overall energy of a group. And that goes to one of my favorite sayings ever from um, Albert Einstein, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but he said that you can't change um, a situation with the same energy that created it. And I think that's so true. I think that it goes to exactly what you're saying, that we have to let go of the past, we have to heal, then we have to be willing to raise our energy, raise our intent in a good, positive way. Exactly. And I, I so had such a crazy weekend. I literally Im- immersed myself in meditation and um, not for the world, but just for myself, because I believe that it does all start with one human life and it accelerates thereafter. So um, I don't know who will ever hear this podcast, but I pray that if you do and you don't know where to start or you don't know where to begin or you're at your wit's end, please reach out because I've been there. I know. You know, that's another theme that comes up in Bump in general, and that is a theme of reaching out for help, that none of us can do it alone. No, and it's... It does get a little bit exhausting doing one person at a time because I do do a lot of that. I do a lot of mentoring one-on-one. It is difficult because it's the same message. So my hope and visualization for the future is that it is a larger group And then after that, after they get the basic knowledge and they need that extra one-on-one, I think that would be more beneficial and time-saving. Oh, no, I think that makes an enormous amount of sense. One of the things you, one of the themes that comes out of your book is choosing one's thoughts. And that sounds obvious, but it's not, is it? No, it's not because we, we, I don't know how, I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that realize they're the creators of their own life, but it is think it, speak it, create it. Because what we think is manifesting in our mind and everyone knows what you speak goes out. It's like a boomerang into the universe. And because the universe holds zero judgment on us, our words come back to us on a silver platter with great abundance. Say So for instance, I always say th- this word in my podcast, the word try. I'm trying to do this. Well, I'm trying to create this life. The word try means in an attempt to do. And so the universe loves us so much that if you keep saying I'm trying, you'll get a whole bundle worth of trying attempts that will go nowhere. And so the words that we speak should be the I am, and what comes after that is the creation. The I am is the essence of the light and love, and what is placed after that is the pure creation. So words are very, very powerful. And you know, in today's society, we are hearing words repeatedly, daily, that serve a zero purpose in moving forward. So it's, it's, wow, it's a very incredible time in life. And I just pray that I get to see the light at the end of this tunnel. (laughs) (laughs) Several of my friends have said, it's such an interesting time to be alive. It is. It's very, very interesting. And mostly for somebody like me, because when I was growing up, I had the very characteristics of what's happening in life right now. I was silenced. I was abused verbally, spiritually, emotionally. Um, I was being gaslighted and told things that were not true, but yet made to believe they were true because it was someone in authority, like the nun in the Catholic church or the priest. And it's, so I'm reliving it again. And I thought that, but then I was by myself doing it. Now I'm in a society doing it. And it's, 
a challenge to say, no, I'm not doing this anymore. I, and what happens then is little by little, your, your, uh, group <laughs> starts to decline of people that are in it, but that's okay. It's okay. I surrender all that. I think a lot of us have experienced that. And I think that it's important to find what I call your tribe. And sometimes you have to lose a tribe to find one that suits you for where you are. Exactly. And it's, I don't want to lose anybody in my tribe, but if they want to lose me, it's going to have to, it's okay. I get it, but I will still continue to love them because I haven't changed. I'm the same woman and I have the same convictions and beliefs. If you don't want that, it's okay. I will still bless you. And I know that eventually it'll, it, it's like you have to break it apart for it to come back together again. I, I agree. I think things do have to break to come back together again. I think going through the breakdown part is not going to be fun, <laughs> but I think that's what lies ahead. I wonder, is there, is there a way we can visualize just a better future, something that we would all have in common? Yes. And that is just to really get into nature because if I live on the big island and I know for me, big island, Hawaii, I know for me, I'm just, it, it's all around me. And it's so easy to just look at something and go, wow, that's so beautiful. So we have to turn ourselves to beautiful things. We, uh, nature, if you like to paint, you can paint, even if you don't know how to paint, just put colors together. Uh, journal, uh, journal about what you see the world like at the end of this and really believe that what you want to see, visualize happening, it will happen. It has to start with you. And as the mass consciousness, we will create that. I think going into the third year of this pandemic, it's time. It's time that, yeah, this is enough. I've, I've seen, I've learned, I forgive. That's the biggest thing is, yes, I forgive that. And now it's time to go forward. And, but what is, what is in that forward? And that is our, that is our, uh, oh, I'm looking for the word. I'm so sorry. Ownership. What that, what that looks like belongs to us as individuals. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you found something in today's podcast that inspires you along your own life's path. Because sometimes a bump in the road is actually a portal into a more conscious and meaningful life. You can subscribe to our free podcast at www.bumpintheroad.us or become a premium member to hear the full conversation. Just go to www.bumpintheroad.us for more information and to sign up.